Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today I would like to talk about the so-called Hilbert spaces theorem, which is um, one of the classical theorems in this intersection of algebra and geometry. So in the end, um, it will have a completely algebraic formulation, you'll see, but it's motivated by, by geometry. I'm not going to show you Hilbert's original motivation, which came from so-called invariant theory, but a slightly different one, which is, uh, let's say, visibly more appealing, at least for me. So the whole point is that there is a certain notion uh, which is studied in algebraic geometry, which is called an algebraic variety. Okay, left aside that people don't agree on the definition of an algebraic variety, so sometimes it's uh, considered to be irreducible, sometimes it's not. Anyway, in this talk, for me, an algebraic variety is just a solution to a system of polynomial equations. Either one polynomial equation, as in my picture up here, I will explain a picture in a second, or a system of linear polynomial equations, or even infinitely many polynomial equations. So kind of, let's say in this case, a subset of R2, which is a, a zero locus of a polynomial. And that's an algebraic variety. And this is really a classic, a really, really classical topic in mathematics. Um, so the most, well, maybe the, the first ever studied geometric objects, something like those guys here, right? Circles, circle, circle, circle was certainly an object that was studied, uh, is studied for a very long time. All of these are fall in this class of algebraic varieties. So the kind of idea is that algebraic varieties are in between um, completely random and very regular and therefore very interesting. Um, of course, there are also solutions to polynomial equations and polynomial equations, that's what mathematicians do all the time. So yeah, sure. Uh, so let's have a look at the picture. So if you, so this is R2 and I have four polynomial equations. I have X, my red one here, X squared, or maybe I do it this way, my red one, x squared plus y squared equals one. And that of course gives you the circle that you see here in the middle. Um, just right, just think about all the solutions to this, to this equation. That's the defining equation for, for the circle. Uh, if you disturb this a little bit then you have a green equation and you get, well, let's say you disturb it in one in direction of the one axis, you get something like an ellipse, which looks a little bit like this. This is a really bad ellipse. Here's a better ellipse on the right hand, on the left hand side of the picture. Anyway, I think you get the point. If you disturb that a little bit further by swapping the signs, then you get to the hyperbola, which roughly looks like this. Um, that looks very good. And slightly different, doesn't quite fit in the family I just showed you, is a hyperbola, uh, which in this formulation roughly looks like this, right? It's x minus y squared. Um, and this case equals one, such that it's, it starts here, for example. This is a point one zero, and that's of course a solution to this equation, right? So this is how you should read this. Um, yeah, so an algebraic variety is kind of this generalization of this idea of having a very nice geometric objects given by uh, certain formulas. And what is a good formula in mathematics? Well, polynomials. Every, absolutely every mathematician likes polynomials. At least I hope absolutely every mathematician likes polynomials. Probably not, probably we will find someone who doesn't like polynomials. But anyway, I do like polynomials and I hope you do as well. And yeah, uh, zero sets of polynomials are nice objects and they are part of algebraic geometry or geometry in general. So this is the kind of the, the object under study. Um, the tricky thing comes from if you have more than one equation. So here I have two equations. Each one of them, red and green, uh, defines you an algebraic variety. The red one is here in the back. It looks a little bit like, like this thing here. Uh, well, I should learn to draw. This is the solution for the red one. And the green one is this kind of slightly strange beast here at the front, just kind of a version of this curve something like this. Well, luckily my picture is made with Mathematica, so let me give a description. 
how you do this, those pictures is much better than uh, my drawing skill here. But anyway, you, I hope you get the point. So you, those, if you have one polynomial equation, you get those surface-like things in this case. But um, you count also the intersections of those, so the common solutions to those uh, polynomial equations. You also count them as algebraic varieties. The blue one here is a common solution, which is kind of a visualization exercise. If you look at it, it's not so hard to see. Right? This is this is a common solution of those two equations, and that also counts as an algebraic variety. And the kind of the question people would like to ask and usually then ask is, well, an algebraic variety, first of all, by definition, is just a zero set of a bunch of polynomials. And the question is kind of, well, a bunch of polynomials might be really, really huge. Uh, and the question is, can you always find finally many polynomials such that um, my algebraic variety, my zero locus is exact, my, my set is exactly the zero locus of only finally many polynomials, which is of course a much stronger statement in some sense, if you think about it, right? You could have hundreds of equations and you look for, well, or infinitely many, and you look for a common solution and maybe you can find uh, finally many such that this works. Uh, my first hunch would be no, this just can't work. But actually the answer is yes, it does, which is a bit surprising, uh, in my opinion at least. So right. So this natural setup, you have uh, solutions to polynomial equations, mathematicians like that, and hopefully everyone likes that. Um, anyway, and they define geometric objects and you kind of wonder whether those geometric objects can be kind of nailed down by a finite amount of information instead of a potentially infinite amount. Um, in this case, this is of course true because I just have two and I just told you I want to look at the intersection of two. But um, if I would give you an infinite number of those things, it, it might not be clear whether you can st strip it down to a finite number, right? Even if I give you four, so here are four equations, uh, they correspond to the colors that you can almost not see in this picture and that you can't, almost can't see them is a little bit the point because this problem is actually not easy if you think in terms of pictures, and that's why you might want to have some algebraic approach to, to, to tackle it. So I claim the intersection of those four, um, those four equations is actually the same blue line as it was before here. So it is the same. I just I, I just gave you four equations instead of two, and I claim the intersection is the same. And as you can see on this picture, as I said, this is a non-trivial problem. So uh, how on earth can you check that? And now imagine you have infinitely many. How on earth can you check whether you can stripe them down? Certainly not, well, maybe not by, by looking at those. So the line, blue line from before roughly lies here. Uh, it's almost not, not visible. Um, yeah, so this is certainly a non-trivial problem if you think about it. Like already for four equations and two equations, that seems to be pretty hard. Now what to do if you have infinitely many equations? It's not so clear, and Hilbert's basis theorem answers that question, which is a bit surprising. So the point here is, and that's where algebra enters, um, these are the same, and the point is they generate the same ideal. Okay, So it's not hard to see that every algebraic variety in the set of sense has an associated ideal, and what you would need to check algebraically is that, um, well, your system of equations given by two and four, they generate the same idea. And then you're good. And then the intersection is the same. This is kind of this nice interplay between algebra and geometry, between um, like really, really sets in sets in this is R3, for example, which certainly have a nice structure. They're not crazy, they're not completely crazy, right? They, they look pretty, they look pretty nice. Um, so they have a nice structure and ideals in, in the polynomial ring. And yeah, Hilbert's basis theorem then takes exactly that approach by ignoring the pictures and looking at the algebra. And the formal statement is something that what you see in textbooks would be something like if, uh, if your ground ring R is Noetherian, then so is the polynomial ring. 
which immediately implies that um, the polynomial ring in finitely many variables is also an authorian, if R is an authorian. Uh, simply because if you have two variables, let me call them X and Y, then the polynomial ring in two variables is a polynomial ring in one variable over a polynomial ring in one variable. You can write this like this. And of course, um, now you can um, uh, apply Hilbert's, Hilbert's basis theorem. So Hilbert's basis theorem is a green box. In its, in its classical formulation. Well, in its classical formulation, actually he, he worked over a field. But anyway, um, the, the one you mostly find in the textbooks, that's a green box and then works for the red box by induction. And it then by the ideal uh, algebraic variety correspondence works for uh, the, or, uh, the, the purple box. And that's what my, was my question from before. Yes, every algebraic variety can be written as a, a zero locus of finitely many polynomials, which is an absolutely non-trivial question. Keep in mind how those things tend to look like. Uh, here's some, some basically some background at the bottom. So um, as I said, for each algebraic variety of an associated ideal, there is a converse, which is usually called Hilbert's Nullstellen. That's, um, that's much more complicated. It's not so complicated, but it's certainly much more complicated to prove than uh, Hilbert's basis theorem than the green box here. So the proof of Hilbert's basis theorem is not hard. It's actually in, on the Wikipedia page in the description. Uh, the converse is Hilbert's Nullstellen. That's it's not quite the converse. Have a look at the link, then you see that it's not quite the converse. Um, but the proof is also more elaborate. So I, I don't even want to go into details. So if you don't know what Noetherian means, let me also say that. Maybe I should have started by saying, by telling you what Noetherian means. Noetherian means that uh, every ideal is finitely generated. And this is of course equivalent to the uh, third property. Well, because um, if I have the correspondence between zero sets and ideals and uh, every polynomial is finitely, uh, every ideal is finitely generated, then I would be the zero locus of the finitely many generated. Uh, the standard examples of Noetherian things are any field and, of course, our good old friend, the integers. So in the integers, you might know that any ideal is actually generated by one element, whatever, ideal generated by four, for example. And kind of the point is almost everything is, is Noetherian. So um, the, the obvious counter example is a polynomial ring in infinitely many variables because you can just write down uh, the ideal generated by all variables and you can't strap that down anymore. Anyway, I'm already starting waffling. So the point is Hilbert's basis theorem is an algebraic solution to a geometric problem. It just tells you the innocent statement that a polynomial ring is Noetherian, so every ideal is finitely generated if the corresponding round ring is Noetherian. The original proof and also the one linked on Wikipedia is actually not constructive, um, which basically means it doesn't tell you how to find the, the polynomials. And as we have seen in those two pictures, that this might not be so easy. So how on earth, how on earth can I be sure that um, really those guys have the same, same intersection somewhere and the exit here? It's completely impossible, at least for me to see Almost, I can believe that it's true if I look at the right picture and I can turn it in Mathematica if I would like to. Um, but but still, it's it's a pretty hard visualization exercise to see that those two actually are the same. The better idea of doing it is what is called Goribna theory, and it's kind of an explicit version of, of um, Hilbert's basis theory. It's pretty amazing. It's an algorithm um, which I can't explain in this video because the video is is too short. Life is too short in general. Um, but anyway, it's an algorithm which I just ran in Mathematica and Mathematica tells me um, that those two ideals are the same. So this span and this span, which is an algebraic solution to the problem of looking at those two pictures. That's the whole point, right? We want to do algebra because in some sense, algebra is more in easier at least to do than geometry. Geometry should always be the guideline, something like if you have a guideline, then yeah, that's a good that's a good one. Geometry is always a good guideline what to study. But in the end, we want something that Mathematica, for example, can understand uh, and just feed it into your favorite uh, computer algebra program um, and it gives you a solution. 
to your maybe geometric problem, which makes it very nice. Just to be sure that I'm not highlighting Mathematica too much, um, Gröbner algorithms are so common nowadays that your favorite computer algebra program will be able to run it. If you're using something different, there will be a, a something like um, a Gröbner basis co command that you can run, I, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, I'm already starting uh, waffling a little bit, so let me just wrap up. So the main idea of Hilbert's basis theorem is actually motivated, or the main question is motivated by geometry. It's about this intersection of, um, of varieties, of polynomial equations, of sets. And he just reformulated everything. Let, let me just say he just reformulated everything in terms of ideals. And then you have an, a way to check whether this is actually true or not. And in the end, the statement, so an algebraic way to check whether this is true or not. And in the end, the statement is, yeah, every polynomial, every ideal in the polynomial ring is um, finitely generated, which is then equivalent to your original problem. It's just a nicer and slightly sleeker statement because, well, it's in the realm of algebra instead of in the realm of uh, geometry. And you can ask for, let's say, an explicit algorithm to do it you end up with something like Rorip Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.